Good morning. I know a few people are filtering in. It's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to begin because we have two wonderful presentations by three terrific faculty members today. Welcome to our fourth annual Department of Medicine Education Day. I'm Dr. Laura Zakowski, Associate Vice Chair for Education, and have been coordinating the Education Day with others for the past four years. This day begins with Grand Rounds, as you can tell, where we will hear results of projects funded by the DOM Education Innovation Grants. These grants are peer-reviewed and awarded by our Education Committee. Following Grand Rounds, we have scheduled workshops and lunch in the MFCB, the Medical Foundation Centennial Building. We have printed some schedules of events. They're in the back of the room if you want to pick one up on your way out, because you certainly can join us for a couple of great workshops as well as lunch over at the MFCB. So I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for the morning. Dr. Carrie Austin will be giving the first presentation. Dr. Austin is assistant professor, CHS, and a graduate of our medical school. She completed both a residency and fellowship in GI and hepatology at UW Health. She was awarded membership in the Gold Humanism Honor Society while a medical student and Phi Beta Kappa while an undergraduate student at UW. Her recent scholarly projects include colonoscopy quality, patient provider gender concordance in endoscopy, and endoscopic injuries, and the last you'll be hearing about here today. Our second presentation will be given by Dr. Sarah Johnson and Dr. Jessica Tischendorf. Dr. Johnson is assistant professor CHS and a graduate of our medical school. She completed residency and hospice and palliative care fellowship at UCSF. She was awarded membership in Alpha Omega Alpha while a medical student. She has also received other awards for outstanding academic achievement, exceptional teaching, and outstanding medical education innovation. Dr. Johnson has taught many students and trainees and has published work on palliative care, surgeon communication, an innovative curriculum that prepares medical students for internship. You'll hear about that more today. And Dr. Jessica Tischendorf is a fellow in infectious disease, having graduated from our medical school and also having acquired an MS degree in education leadership and poly policy analysis. She's also a member of Alpha Omega Alpha and has received many awards for academic achievement and outstanding research. In addition to today's presentation, Dr. Tischendorf's scholarly projects have included C. diff infection, drug-resistant organisms, and quality of faculty feedback to learners. So let's introduce our first speaker, Dr. Austin. Thank you. Thank you. OK, my name is Carrie Austin. I'm one of the um, new GI faculty members. OK, maybe. Clint. It was working, I swear. <laughs> it doesn't work there either. Okay, there we go. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a project uh, that Dr. Zakowski mentioned was uh, funded by the DOM Education Grant, um, looking at taking care of ourselves, um, building a culture of overuse pre injury prevention and GI fellowship. Um, I have no financial disclosures. So the objectives for today's talk, first I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the prevalence and risk factors for overuse injuries among gastroenterologists then describe some activities here at UW Health in efforts to uh, prevent these overuse injuries, specifically among GI fellows. And finally, identify some strategies to effectively implement team-based interventions um, and foster interprofessional communication and learning. So um, as most talks do, um, I wanted to start with a um, kind of a case. And you know, they always say for grand rounds, you're supposed to take out all identifying factors. Well, it's actually me, so. 100%. <laughs> um, so the way that our fellowship is set up, um, in the first 
three months of fellowship training. We spend a, a whole month over at the Digestive Health Center doing all outpatient endoscopies. And um, there's 10 half days in a week. Two of those half days are spent in clinic, and then the other eight half days are spent scoping with different faculty members. And within the first two weeks, um, I started having pain in my right thumb. So I went home, told my husband, I think immediately applied for specialty specific disability, and um, then started talking to the, each faculty member that I would scope with that day about, you know, did this happen to them? What sort of things can I do to prevent this? Um, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that two things. Number one was that a lot of the faculty within our department had themselves experienced overuse injuries, or at the time I didn't know that's what it was called, but pain while scoping. And number two was that um, nobody knew anything about how to prevent it. So I was having pain in my, in my right hand, um, and nobody really had any suggestions or, or recommendations of what I should be doing differently. And finally, something else that kind of came out of it was um, that I'm really nosy, and so I would ask everybody who was having problems with this, and nobody seemed to be talking to each other about it. Um, I knew about everybody else's injuries, and I'd be like, oh, well, so-and-so has problems with their wrist, and they were like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so kind of that, that became very obvious. So like a good fellow, I was like, I'm going to change the field of gastroenterology. I'm going to study this. Um, and of course, you always think that it's never been studied before. Um, but when I started looking into the data, there was tons of data out there about overuse injuries and practicing staff. Um, and a, meta, or a systematic review, obviously that's a big range, but a huge percentage of gastroenterologists um, in survey-based studies had reported overuse injuries um, at some point during their career. And the data here really uh, took off after screening colonoscopies became a thing, um, after Medicare approved that, because the scoping numbers just skyrocketed. So what are the risk factors for development of overuse injuries? Um, these have been well established, uh, not necessarily within the field of GI, but overuse injuries in general. So high repetition, high force, awkward joint postures, so anything outside of the neutral body position, direct pressure, and these sort of things have really been studied in in sports. So um, a lot of the data comes from this. And it seems strange to me that, um, you know, you, you hear a lot about overuse injuries in, in athletics. It seemed odd that, you know, performing a colonoscopy would be similar in terms of the mechanism of injury, but that's what it has to do with. It has to do with that repetitive stress over years um, and procedures. So what about endoscopy? Um, I recognize that most people in this room have probably not um, ever performed an endoscopy. And if you have uh, been a part of one, you were probably uh, asleep. So <laughs> hopefully it went well. Um, so this is just looking at what is it like to perform an endoscopy. So in our left hand over here um, is where we hold the scope, and you have two wheels um, that are manipulated with the left thumb. And what that does is uh, adjust the tip of the scope up and down, left, right. And then the right hand is this one. That's not a, not a real butt, it's a model. Um, and you can see that one's kind of going back and forth, and it's doing something we call torquing. Um, and that makes kind of broader uh, movements throughout the colon. Um, so we stand for these procedures uh, throughout the day. So a lot of standing puts a lot of stress on the back. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the increasing endoscopy demands have been notified or have been identified as a significant risk factor for um, overuse injuries, getting at that repetition um, uh, piece of uh, risk. So <clears throat> within the GI literature, there's a, a lot of data looking at over, excuse me, <clears throat> overuse injuries in practicing gastroenterologists. And the two things that pan out over time and time again are number of procedures performed, and years in practice. So then I was like, well, why am I having issues? What's going on with that? And am I the only one who's ever had this happen before? Um, we don't have those classic risk factors that we see in practicing gastroenterologists in fellowship, right? We don't have the high numbers or 40 years in practice. So I sat down with my research mentor for this, uh, Dr. Simona Saha, and we one thing was clear that there was a lot of data out there in practicing gastroenterologists, but really wasn't any data about during fellowship training. 
So we developed a survey that was similar to um, one that had previously been published. And the goal of this was to, de to determine, you know, is, am I alone? Um, or is this a common thing that others are experienced during fellowship training? So our survey was, like I said, modeled after this 2015 survey. Um, there was about 29 questions. We distributed it nationwide. And there was a whole bunch of questions. So, um, you know, age, gender, how many procedures have you performed, what's your activity level outside of training, things like that. But the bulk of really what we wanted to get at was prevalence of overuse injuries. So have you experienced an overuse injury during GI training? And we found about a 20% um, rate answered yes. Again, this is all self-reported data. And another 7% saying maybe. What was significant in these findings? Well, what we found was that the classic risk factors in GI didn't necessarily matter. Like I mentioned before, the number of procedures, year of training didn't matter. Um, and the only significant finding that we found was that gender mattered in our study. And this was new. This hasn't really uh, been shown in the literature before. Um, and I think it's interesting. I could probably talk for like two hours about this, but I realize that it's interesting to nobody else. Um, so I'll spare you. But two things I did want to mention. Um, number one is that back, so these, the first study of this kind came in 1995. And in that, at that time, 5% of gastroenterologists were women. Um, the repeat in 2015 had about 13% of women um, being gastroenterologists, which was equivalent to the nationwide data at the time. Our survey, so the gender gap in GI is improving. Right now there's about 30% of fellows that are G, uh, women. So it's closing, but, um, and that's what our survey showed. So we had simply a, a higher number of women completing the survey. The other thing um, that didn't necessarily come out of endoscopy data, this is out of um, the just kind of other journals looking at grip strength. And what this shows here is, um, although I don't like to admit it, <laughs> this is men's grip strength. So um, on, this, on the left-hand side, we have force generated. And these are those, um, they have a name, but it's, it's like dynamometer or something ridiculous that I don't, don't really know how to say. Um, but this is the strength that's generated and age. And the black dots up here are the men, and the open dots down here are women. And you can see that women's uh, peak grip strength uh, is in their 30s to 40s and then declines over time. And it's equivalent to that of about a man in his 80s, um, which is kind of depressing. <laughs> And there's similar graphs looking at pinch force, um, which are two, two things that are commonly done during endoscopy. So um, again, that's not, this hasn't panned out in the uh, practicing endoscopists, but um, who knows what time will show as more women enter the workforce. So now that we found this data, about a month later, we got the email saying apply for the Department of Medicine in the, uh, Education Innovation Grant. And so we did, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, we decided to, we wanted to say, okay, now that we know this is out there, what do we do with it? How can we prevent these injuries and prevent our fellows from getting injured um, going forward? So uh, we developed a train the trainers workshop and curriculum um, here at UW with the goals being threefold. One was to improve the awareness of overuse injuries, both in staff as well as in um, fellowship training. Um, the main goal was really to promote a cul uh, culture of injury prevention um, amongst our staff and fellows. Like I'd mentioned earlier, you know, the, the rates of injury are really high, so the, there's a good chance that a lot of our staff are going to be affected by this, um, and nobody was really talking about it. And finally, the overall goal was to decrease injuries sustained at UW. So before the workshop, um, we had to get a baseline because uh, we didn't know what people knew. So in 2009, there was an article in one of our journals about uh, GI ergonomics and giving some recommendations. But the question was, do, do our providers know about these recommendations, and are they following them in practice? So we surveyed the, uh, our staff, um, looking at their, whether or not they knew about them, and then performed blinded observations, um, looking at if they were following them. So there's a lot of things in endoscopy that you can't necessarily control. Um, but the recommendations were threefold for general um, endoscopy. And really what they have to do with is the things that we can control within the room. So number one is looking at the uh, monitor height. So um, there's been a lot of data showing that if the monitor is too high, 
it creates a uh, flexion of the neck and, I'm sorry, extension and can cause issues with neck problems. Number two is the bed height. So um, the goal is kind of at, you see this angle here, they supply. Um, so at 90 degrees from uh, neutral position with the, with the elbow or slightly below. So it's not causing um, extension of the, of the arm. And then the third is use of a cushion mat, which has really been just extrapolated from other fields. Um, the workshop itself was uh, held on a Saturday morning at the Digestive Health Center, which is exactly where everybody wanted to be. Um, and the attendings, or the people who came were the, uh, all of our GI fellows that were able to. And then all faculty that were involved with endoscopic training of our fellows were invited. So um, basically every gastroenterologist in the city, um, our fellows train at UW, the VA, Meritor, and um, St. Mary's. So everybody was invited as well as the nursing supervisors, both at the hospital and the Digestive Health Center. Uh, there were four presentations and then a breakout brainstorming session. The first uh, presentation was just me talking about overuse injuries in general, both the national and local data of faculty and fellows. The next was uh, a woman, Mary Sesto, who is currently um, in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, um, talking about work, work, fa oh my gosh, work factors engineering um, and work systems models. So I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with the SEEPS model, um, which is originally developed for patient safety. And Mary focused a lot on the left-hand side of kind of what the work systems model is. So how do we interact with the tools? What are the tasks at hand? How can those things be modified uh, to better benefit us rather than you know, getting in the way of our um, procedures? Um, the keynote speaker was a woman named Amandeep Shergal, who's a gastroenterologist at UCSF. Um, she's really one of the leading experts on GI ergonomics, um, wrote most of the papers and guidelines on this topic. Um, she also talked about how can we implement fellowship training, uh, or, or implement ergonomics in fellowship training. Um, and then finally, um, Melissa Burkhart, who's an occupational therapist here at UW, who specializes in uh, hand and upper extremities, went over a lot of, this was a little bit more interactive. Um, so went over a lot of stretches that uh, for common injuries that we see, um, strengthening exercises, and then finally, um, what sort of uh, splints and kind of treatment options going forward, um, who to contact, stuff like that. So a little bit more practical things. The brainstorming um, breakout sessions, a lot of things came out of it, but I just wanted to focus on two. One was this ergonom the idea of an ergonomics timeout, which... Um, you know, during the procedure, before we start, we always have to do a timeout. So it's, you know, identifying the patient, what the procedure is, why we're doing it, and then um, taking a timeout for ergonomics to say, to control those three things that we can. So mat, bed, monitor. And the idea was that, you know, we do this every time um, to really get the room set up. Um, and either, I usually do it just kind of in my head. Um, but if the fellows in the room doing it out loud to kind of promote that, that culture that this is something that is important to us. And then finally, um, empowering the nurses and techs as part of the team for preventing injuries, um, kind of getting them on, the, on board that this is something that we really want to do going forward. And I'll talk about a little bit about that in a second here. After the workshop, uh, six months later, we again repeated those blinded observations. Um, the monitor height improved to over 90% of cases. Prior to that, it was in the 60s. Um, there was no change in bed height or use of a cushioned mat. Um, so we do still have room to improve. So now that we had done this, we were like, well, what do we do next? How can we keep the momentum going forward? Um, we added a summer lecture um, similar to the, for the GI fellows, we have um, a summer in introductory series that is, is similar to the, what is that called, the intern lecture series, um, that kind of focuses on the basics of GI, what to look for on call, stuff like that. Um, so we added an ergonomics uh, lecture. And then we also videotaped the workshop um, all four hours. <laughs> and I got to go through it and pare down what we thought was really important. So it's about 45 minutes, um, and that's available both to staff who are unable to make it, and then the fellows as well, if anybody wants a refresher. We've also talked about doing, like, repeating yearly observations, both um, for research purposes and also um, to give feedback to different providers if, if they want to know what they're doing wrong. 
Some people um, don't want to, which is fine. Um, but uh, going forward, kind of looking at the data going on. So that brings me to the last point um, of looking at strategies to, to implement team-based interventions. Um, so when uh, Dr. Saha and I sat down and were awarded the grant, we wanted to see where we were starting from. So we didn't really know how to improve if we, you know, it, did we even need room for improvement. And one of the things we realized quickly was we wanted to be able to watch people performing endoscopies without them realizing um, that someone was watching. And one of the ideas we had was, well, the nurse is in the room, why don't we just have them watch us and, tell, and give us feedback and see what we're doing wrong? So we met with the uh, nursing supervisors over at the Digestive Health Center, and they were like, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. And the reason being that, you know, the nurses are busy. They have a lot going on. They're monitoring the patient. They're giving meds. They're w watching vital signs. They were like, no offense, guys, but they don't really care what you're doing. <laughs> I was like, all right, that's fair. Um, but they said, well, why don't you have the tech watch? So this is <laughs> my attempt at clip art. Um, but this is a bird's eye view at looking at the procedure room. So the way that it's set up, um, this is the patient, um, and the nurse is up by the head, right? They're, give, they're monitoring the patient for breathing and, you know, really kind of uh, talking the patient through the procedure. And then we're back here by the butt. And then this is the tech, okay? So the tech, and this is a real-time picture. Um, I'm not going to comment on the ergonomic position or lack of PPE. Um, of this provider, but you can see that the tech, uh, they're, the, they're the ones who are giving us the instruments that we need, they're um, taking care of any uh, issues that go on with the scope throughout the procedure, and, and they're, not, they're not as bothered by what's going on with the patient, per se. So it really made a lot more sense to kind of switch, switch our um, observations to them. And logistically speaking, there's over 40 nurses at the Digestive Health Center and about half of that of techs. So it's just easier for us to train techs um, than it would be to train the nurses. Yep. So, um, so that's kind of within the field of GI. I also wanted to uh, mention that it's not necessarily unique to GI, so other fields as well um, have reported work-related or overuse injuries. Not surprisingly, a lot of the procedural fields um, within the department, or within internal medicine, as well as interventional cardiology, you know, a lot of this data comes from surgery as well. Um, but over 50% of uh, interventional cardiologists report spine issues, and then in primary care as well. Um, so over 35% report musculoskeletal injuries, most commonly um, computer-related injuries, which is not surprising. Um, so looking at the workstation ergonomics, um, this comes from a su recent study out of UW, actually, um, from the Department of Family Medicine looking at computer use. Um, and not surprisingly, I'm sure it's not surprising to anybody here, but um, computer use is increasing within medicine. And over six hours a day are spent at the computer. Um, and for, uh, they also found that for every one hour of patient interaction time, there's two hours of behind the scenes computer, um, computer use. So that ne isn't necessarily continuous, but what we know from you know, several years ago was that, is that the risk of developing an overuse injury computer related uh, increases after just four hours of computer use a day. So really placing uh, primary care providers or, or uh, people who are mostly at computers all day at risk as well. So finally, I just want to leave uh, with some recommendations. So um, really the goal of our, our workshop was to you know, promote this culture of safety. Um, and I think this kind of starts at the top. And we were lucky enough um, to have our Michael Lucy, hey, Dr. Lucy. Uh, he w sent an email to every person within the division and said, hey, we really would like you to come and support Carrie and Simona. They're having this workshop. And we and it, worked, um, we got over a 50% um, attendance rate. And one of the things that Dr. Shergill, who uh, came from UCSF, kept saying was, 
you know, this is what I do every day, and I can't get my own division to buy into it. Um, so she was really impressed with, with um, how much people uh, valued this. Um, and one other thing I wanted to just say was that um, the, one, the thing that I think I learned the most from this was this, the strengths of other um, uh, staff within the field. So for us, it was really identifying the techs as someone who could help us um, with ergonomics. And so my, my right hand got better. I'm sure you're all very happy to hear that. Um, but then when I started as staff, I started having pain in my left wrist. And so I started asking around cause, uh, to the other staff, and somebody mentioned, oh, yeah, I have that too. I started putting my hand. So the patient's asleep, right, so they don't care. He started putting his hand on the patient's hip so that when he's withdrawing, looking for polyps, it takes the weight out of that hand um, and uh, some of the stress out of it. So I started doing that, and it really helps. Um, but I noticed that when I'm, when I'm scoping, I'm not thinking about it all the time. And so it would slip off. I would go back to my other um, uh, not ergonomically good positions. And so I'd, I, what I've started doing is mentioning it to the tech when I start in the morning. I'll say, hey, I've been having some wrist pain. Um, can you, I'm, I'm trying to do this, I'm resting it on the patient. Can you, if you see me slip off, can you just say, hey, carry wrist? And they, they're all like, oh, yeah, well, you bet. And they're all really happy to boss me around. So um, <clears throat> kind of getting them involved as well. And I think that that can be not just in GI, but also, you know, um, getting the MAs and nurses involved um, can help as well. And then finally, knowing the available resources. So um, I just want to give a shout out to the Ergonomic Services Department at, here at UW, uh, specifically at Employee Health. So um, this program is run by a gentleman named Steve Hill. He's a physical therapist. Um, and if you go to UConnect and just type in ergonomics, a whole bunch of stuff comes up. And there's a ton of resources available to us. <clears throat> when I started doing this, everyone a lot of people that I would talk to would be like, oh, that's just for the nurses. We don't qualify that for that as physicians because we're not employed by UW Health. You know, we're UWMF. None of those services apply to us. That's not true. We can get in all of these services uh, for us as well. Um, there are several things if you go to this website. So you can take an ergonomic self-assessment, um, just kind of going through it online. You don't have to talk to anybody. Um, the, the other thing that's really neat and a great service to us is that if you contact someone in this department, they will come to you wherever you work. So it doesn't have to be here at the hospital. It can be at University Station or out um, at East Clinic. They will come to you and watch you perform your daily activities and give you feedback um, and recommendations of what you can do to, to uh, prevent injuries going forward. So um, if you remember nothing else, just remember you connect ergonomics. Um, and with that, um, we're not doing questions, I heard. So, Jess, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Austin. That was really well done. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. But first, I want to be clear that if we had any significant conflicts of interest, we would be in Hawaii right now. I want you to raise your hands if in your current position you're involved in patient care. So most of us. And raise your hands if before you were expected to care for patients that you received training on how to do so. Most of us, that's reassuring. <laughs> now I ask, raise your hands if you are involved in teaching or expected to teach in your current position. Similar amount of hands. And prior to being expected to teach, did you receive formal training on how to do so effectively? So significantly less. So why is there this difference between our training for our clinical duties versus our training for our teaching duties? We're all doing both. And I would propose that there are two incorrect assumptions that are leading to this. So number one being the Assumption that we are either good or bad teachers, 
that you either have it or you don't. And the reality is, is that teaching is a learnable skill. That no matter where we are in our career, that we can all learn to enhance our teaching skills. Number two, the idea that if we have expertise, knowledge, that the teaching will just follow. But as Dr. Amy Zielinski can attest to, our PhD educator, that it takes specific knowledge, skills, and practice to gain expertise in teaching. As you are all aware, our current DOM strategic plan emphasizes the support and growth of all of our educators. And our project aim was to develop the education expertise of our resident educators. So what we're hoping to convey today is the idea that in the process of learning how to teach, that will be augmented by us having growth mindsets as well as doing deliberate practice. To navigate and discuss our resident as educator or Ray curriculum as well as the associated website. We're gonna focus specifically on our feedback module and then lastly, we hope to have you be able to discuss what is a way that you can take some of these resources and use them in your own teaching and personal development. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't remember much about the brain. But I do know that it can help us to learn a lot. So <laughs> that's about it, really. <laughs> um, Just as we can learn how to expertly treat infective endocarditis or to efficiently run a family meeting, we can also learn to teach better. And the first step in the process towards doing this is we need to move away from a fixed mindset about teaching. We are not either good or bad teachers. We need to move towards a growth mindset in the process of learning how to teach better. So yes, we can all learn how to teach. And yes, mistakes will happen along the way in the learning process, as it always does. Just like when my kid was learning how to walk, he fell. He's fine, he can walk now. <laughs> and then lastly, that yes, no matter where we are in our career as teachers, that we can continue to enhance and refine our teaching toolkit. And these qualities can be cultivated with practice and specifically with deliberate practice. So expertise, meaning the ability to do something automatically or with less conscious effort, is developed after we spend focused effort and time and receive coaching to do so, to improve our outcomes. We focus on the things that are challenging, we focus on the things that are hard, and we practice those. So for example, if you wanted to give grand rounds without sitting in the corner in the fetal position the whole time, what might you do? You would practice. You would get coaching and feedback. And voila, here I am. <laughs> so musicians do this. Professional athletes do this. And we need to do this as we're thinking about learning how to teach emphasize the importance of learning the skills and knowledge, practicing, receiving coaching, and continuing to repeat that process. So in 2014, Dr. Tischendorf and I aim to take these concepts of deliberate practice and growth mindset and bring those into a resident as educator or Ray curriculum. So Ray curricula, and we much prefer the RAE acronym as opposed to the RAT. Um, just do. <laughs> These were not new at the time, but they were growing. There were governing bodies at the medical school and at the residency level that were recommending them. Data was showing that residents felt unprepared to teach despite the fact that they spent a large amount of time teaching and that medical students were taught in the majority of their time by residents. And data also showed that resident as educator curricula were beneficial at multiple levels, at the resident level, at the medical student level, and as well as the, at the institution level. So residents who participate in Ray curricula 
enjoyed them. They liked doing it. They also demonstrate increased gains in clinical and medical knowledge, which in some data actually was relayed as increased in training exam scores. It's important. <coughs> Excuse me. The medical students who were taught by these resident educators liked it. They liked working with resident teachers. And they also benefit from near peer teaching meaning that they're working with somebody who is closer to their developmental level, somebody who has a better sense and remembers where they're coming from, as well as where they need to get to in the near future. So the other benefit with near peer teaching or working with somebody who's closer to you in the development of a skill set is that it's less intimidating, which is also known as smaller psychological size. So as you can imagine, if you were being taught by somebody that you felt had a smaller psychological size, so for example, a resident who you knew was in your position just a year prior, you might be more willing to admit mistakes or gaps in knowledge, as opposed to if you were working with an attending or somebody that seemed larger than life in faculty, like Dr. Vogelman. It's a compliment. <laughs> It's just hard, it just is, right? When we are attending, we're in charge of grades, and so students feel less comfortable with admitting their mistakes, errors, and what they don't know. So at the institution level, institutions that have residence educator curricula show a few benefits. So one is you increase your pool of effective educators, which helps you to meet teaching demands, of which there are many. Two, Residents who participate in Ray curricula also increasingly go into academia. And then lastly, and I'll say this from more of a personal perspective, not particular data, but the faculty who are teaching residents how to teach are also becoming better teachers themselves. What is one of the best ways to learn something? It's to teach it. So as Dr. Tischendorf and I were working towards designing our resident as educator curriculum, we came across an expected challenge. Residents are not sitting around waiting for somebody to fill their time. They're busy. <laughs> they have a lot to do. And so the majority of rate curricula are actually designed to be delivered in person over the course of many hours or perhaps over a few days. As we were considering this, there was another consideration as we were planning our residence educator curriculum. And that was the medical school need for a medicine-focused intern prep course, or an IPC. Intern prep courses are aimed towards improving and easing the transition from medical student to intern, which we all know is hard. However, these courses are very resource intensive because they're focused on practice and coaching, as we're talking about. So who better to teach students about being a new resident than residents themselves? So we decided to embed our resident as educator curriculum into a pilot of a medicine-focused intern prep course. And what this meant is that residents who volunteered to teach in the IPC or to work in the Ray curriculum were assigned a topic in the intern prep course, their own session, they created, designed, and then taught that session and received ongoing mentoring and feedback in that process, as well as observation and feedback of their teaching. So with DOM Med Ed Committee support in 2014 in the fall, we launched our pilot of the Residence Educator Curriculum here at UW, shortly followed by the Medicine Intern Prep Course pilot. So this is a schematic of our curriculum, which is designed to be delivered largely asynchronously, meaning that we don't need to be in the same room at the same time and manage those busy schedules, because that's really hard to do. And the white boxes represent the asynchronous or electronic tasks, things that are done via email, document, comments, all that technology. Um, the red boxes represent the few in-person sessions that we do. And so the first two are introduction, reinforcement, and discussion of concepts and knowledge. 
And then the last red box is actually the teaching session themselves. The residents are in the interim prep course teaching their session, being observed by faculty. After this, they receive faculty feedback. And then in this last year, a little further after, <laughs> uh, student evaluation data as well. I wanted to talk a little bit about the pedagogical basis for our curriculum design. And the first being, the residents are learning by applying the knowledge and skills that we talk about to the development of their own teaching session, which is situated learning. As we're teaching them about how do you write effective learning objectives, they are then shortly after applying those and writing their own objectives and getting feedback on those. We know that situated learning increases skill acquisition. Second, we rely heavily on the concept of task deconstruction, meaning you break down creating and teaching a se teaching session into smaller, more manageable tasks. And the reasons we do this are, number one, it's more flexible and less overwhelming for the residents. As we said, they're busy. Two, it also makes sure that there are opportunities for the faculty to oversee and make sure that the curriculum is going well for the IPC and frankly helps to minimize my <laughs> worry. I know the residents are doing it, but it just helps me to know for sure um, and oversee that. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, it highlights the importance of preparation in effective teaching and being organized and practicing. We also utilize the concept of peer feedback. So the residents are paired with another resident or resident pair if they're working co-teaching and they do a dry, focused dry run of their session and give each other feedback, which they then email to us. And we know that peer teaching is a valuable thing. And we know it's not only valuable to the person who's receiving the feedback, but the peer who's giving it. They're learning too. And then lastly, we try to find and work within the learning edge for each individual resident, which is also known as the zone of proximal development. Where do people just need a little bit of help? And then they got this. And we also have this concept underpinning our scaffolded curriculum, which is shown here. So we had residents who were interested after this first year of participating a second year or even a third year. And so we developed this with the idea of how can we continue to push them and help them grow more. And so the second year curriculum builds on that foundational first year of basic classroom development, design, and implementation and feedback. And the second year hones in more on classroom management skills as well as evaluation of education assessments. And then for those residents who are with us for a third year, there's an opportunity to practice their own mentoring skills um, as well as design individual goals, for example, teaching with simulation or teaching with technology. So we did it. We implemented our residence educator curriculum and then, then what happened? So this is data from our third year of the Ray curriculum. Um, involves internal medicine residents. At this point we had disseminated also to, internal, to family medicine and pediatrics and working with their faculty and residents to do the same curriculum. And as you can see, the residents reported an increased ability to design an effective classroom teaching session, as well as to utilize the various teaching methodologies that we had talked about. More importantly, they also had gains in the realm of feedback. Specifically, feeling more comfortable with giving and receiving constructive feedback, which I think we all know is a very, very important task and skill to have. So what about our other learners who are equally as important, the medical students? What did they think of this? So in this same year, for each session that the students were in, they were asked to rate, or on an agreement scale, this session was effective, based on a Likert scale of one being, I strongly agree, this session was effective, to seven, I strongly disagree, this session was effective. The median score for resident taught sessions was 2.1. The students agreed that these were effective. The other thing that I wanted to highlight here is that each year in the feedback comments, 
that the students are required to put, one thing that was done well, one thing to consider trying differently next time. There's a consistent theme, a few actually. One is that they feel like they're more prepared in their perception of what interns are to do. Two, they feel supported, they feel safe to make mistakes and admit what they don't know. And then lastly, they feel that the personal stories and hearing those help to lessen their worry and anxiety that we all have when we're making big transitions. And I want to just highlight my observations over the four years of doing this, that the residents do a phenomenal job. They work very hard and the teaching sessions are excellent. I have learned and continue to learn so much from working with them. So, we had expanded to working with family medicine and pediatric faculty to implement this curriculum with their residents. And with this continued growth, we were presented with the challenge of how to disseminate our curriculum in a high fidelity as well as efficient manner. So Dr. Tischendorf will talk about how we approach that. I'm just getting started. <laughs> um, so for the latter portion of our presentation here today, I will discuss with you our solution to that dissemination challenge, our new resident as educator website that just went live in 2018. But first, can a website work for something like this? Admittedly, there is very limited experience with a primarily asynchronous or web-based uh, teaching skill development curriculum. But we know from other areas of instruction, and specifically in medical education, that blended learning is at least as effective as traditional face-to-face -face instruction for knowledge acquisition. Another important concept we needed to keep in mind when designing our website was that uh, the opportunity to interact with the platform, whether that be through narration or video, leads to improved learner satisfaction and knowledge acquisition. So for the tour portion of our talk here, we'll provide a list of our available modules. We'll take you to our homepage and show you how to navigate the website. We'll review our feedback module in detail. And then briefly, I'll just share with you some examples of other media formats that we've incorporated into the website. And then conclude with an opportunity for you to discuss how you might use this and to actually bookmark our page for you to explore further. So this is our home page. You will see across the top here there are several tabs, many of which are specific to the residents teaching in the interim prep course. Though I think of interest to the wider audience is our modules tab, which when you click brings up this page. And this is a listing of the modules that we've developed for teachers. We offer content on teaching in various settings, not just classroom-based teaching, but small group teaching and clinical teaching. And then we also offer guidance on other teaching skills, such as active learning strategies, how to cultivate a supportive learning environment, and again, what we'll review in detail is how to provide effective feedback. To orient you before I take you to our feedback module, each of our modules is set up similarly. We start with an overview and along, you'll see along the right hand side, key points from the module. We then dive into what we call our guiding principles, which is the bulk of our content. After we re uh, review that content, we provide educators with an opportunity for self-assessment, is what we refer to as our practice section. And then we encourage resident educators to immediately apply the principles that we reviewed in that module to development of their teaching session in the interim prep course. We then conclude with a brief wrap up and then additional references for individuals who are interested in reading more. And as an example, uh, as I said, we're gonna review our feedback module, which also provides us a nice opportunity to review with the audience the tenets of providing learners effective feedback. So this is that feedback module. You'll see, as I mentioned, we begin with an overview, and really that's to orient educators to what we'll be talking about in the module. And then along your right-hand side here, we offer key learning points for the modules. In this section, we emphasize the difference between formative or coaching feedback and summative or evaluative feedback. We also emphasize the importance of feedback being specific, 
timely and frequent and offering learners concrete next steps. And in this module, we also include strategies to ease the practice of soliciting feedback from your supervisors, which can certainly be equally challenging. This is the guiding principles section I mentioned, and here is really the bulk of the content. We review tenets of effective feedback, and as an example, we highlight the importance of engaging a learner in self-assessment when you're having a feedback discussion, and we provide example prompts of how you might initiate that conversation. For example, tell me one thing you do well as a teacher. And then, again, conclude with an opportunity for self-assessment. In this module, it's a set of multiple choice questions. The, there are different ways we, we provide self-assessment and then instruct the residents to, again, immediately apply what they learned in the module to their teaching session um, in the IPC. And then conclude with a wrap-up and additional resources. You'll see in many of our modules when you navigate the website that uh, along the lower left-hand side here, we have links to a mentor guide, which we won't explore here, but also part of our work has been developing train-the-trainer materials uh, in order to allow us to disseminate this to other departments um, in the medical school. So those materials are found in the mentor guide. Very specific to the interim prep course, though other senior educators might find some useful material here when you're mentoring more junior teachers. I just want to briefly share with you some examples of other media that we've incorporated into the platform. Uh, we have videos from prior interim prep course teaching sessions. Uh, Matt Brunner, current chief resident, and Claire O'Connor, former internal medicine resident. And then we also have scripted videos with a trained actress that are really used to highlight key teaching principles that we emphasize in our curriculum. We've provided several virtual forums for resident educators to share their reflections on prompts and questions. In this example here, we ask resident educators to reflect on a particularly effective lecturer that they attended and what that, that speaker did to help keep them engaged throughout the time. Their responses would come up on this Padlet and they'd be able to review responses from other educators as well. And then we've also incorporated Qualtrics technology that allow us to track individual responses and then provide personalized feedback to those educators. Certainly the focus of our work to date has been developing resident educators to teach in the interim prep course. Though we see our work being applicable to a much broader group of educators and in many other venues. So I'd like you to take a moment, turn to the individual next to you, and share one idea of how you can see our resource applying to your teaching skill development. I'm going to have us come back together, and then I'll ask just a couple individuals from the audience uh, to share how they can see this work applying to their role as a teacher. Brian? Thanks for the comment. So Brian's comment was 
utilizing this resource to tailor his teaching based on his clinical setting and then also to instruct residents interested in teaching for uh, two additional resources. Is there uh, perhaps one more to share? So Dr. Trowbridge's comment was for faculty in the ambulatory setting who have perhaps not taught for several years, um, they could be directed to this resource. And the clinical teaching module does discuss some outpatient teaching strategies too, so I think there is some content that could be useful there. Um, so before we conclude, I'm going to have you take out your smartphone or your device um, and actually bookmark our website. Uh, that is if the VA Wi-Fi allows. And the, the link or the um, website is ray, R A E, dot medicine, dot whisk, dot edu. And then to conclude with just a brief summary of what we discussed today great teachers are not just born. It's important to have a growth mindset towards teaching and to practice specific skills. Ideally, identify a coach and provide each other with effective, formative feedback on your teaching skills. And we certainly hope that our website can be a resource uh, for those of you interested in using it in your own teaching skill development. And we're excited to hear how you use it going forward. There are... I knew that was going to happen at some point. <laughs> Um, so there are several individuals to acknowledge. First and foremost, the many resident and fellow educators that have made the interim prep course and our Ray curriculum such a success over the years. To the Department of Medicine Education Committee for supporting this work, uh, not just once but twice. Um, and to Do It Academic Technology for helping to execute this vision. And for the remainder of the individuals listed here who have provided support to uh, Dr. Johnson or myself for this work, uh, in, in many ways. We thank you very much and we're certainly happy to take any questions or comments. We have just a few minutes for questions, so we'll take a couple of questions, but then afterwards DOM Education Day continues over at the Medical Foundation Centennial Building and there are some agenda in the back of the room if you'd like to attend some of our workshops or to come to the lunch. If you haven't registered ahead of time, that's okay. Please come over if you wish. All right, so I'll turn it over for any questions. That's a great question. Um, we had looked at data the prior two years, so the first two years of doing that when we had eight resident educators and then 16. It's a little hard to compare, but it was not, it was different and actually trended a little bit better compared to faculty taught sessions. So. Oh, I'm sorry. The, <laughs> it says right here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fogel. We're amazing. For the video. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. everyone. Enjoy. Happy Med Day.